Thank you, Scott. Uh, we were provided with some uh, wonderful programs this morning. We've come to expect the Lincoln Institute Symposia to provide uh, excellent speeches, and it certainly did today. Puts me in mind of a story I heard uh, the other day about uh, the devil. Uh, the devil got a new groove down to hell, and he said, uh, boys, let me give you a quick orientation here. Uh, I'm the devil. I run this place. Uh, you won't like it. Uh, I'm good at my job, and my job is to make you miserable. There'll be uh, weeping here. There'll be wailing. There'll be gnashing of teeth. One guy said, what if you don't have teeth? The devil said, in that case, teeth will be provided for those of evil. <clears throat> Far happier will be uh, the next remarks provided us. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Leonard. Dr. Leonard received her master's degree in United States history at the University of California, Riverside, and her doctorate at the same institution. For the past dozen years, she has taught at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. At Colby, Dr. Leonard is the John J. and Cornelia V. Gibson Associate Professor of History. She also serves as chair of the Department of History and Director of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. Her most recent book is Lincoln's Avengers, Justice, Revenge, and Reunion After the Civil War, which was published last year. This volume from W.W. W. Norton was chosen as a selection for the History Book Club. Lincoln's Avengers considers the conspiracy trial, often presented in isolation from other events, as an opening chapter in the era of Reconstruction, tracing the battle between uh, Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt, who led the prosecutions, and the new president, Andrew Johnson. This was a battle that um, encompassed conflicts which the nation as a whole would soon face regarding a Reconstruction shape and post-war America. Lincoln's Avengers has been described as a thoughtful, compelling, insightful book for Civil War studies by critic Roger Bishop and lauded uh, from coast to coast by reviewers. Dr. Lennon has also authored... Uh, has also authored Yankee Women, Gender Battles in the Civil War, and she is also the author of All the Daring of the Soldier, Women of the Civil War Armies, which was chosen as a selection for the History Book Club and the Book of the Month Club. In The War Was You and Me, edited by Joan Cashin for Princeton University Press in 2002, she contributed a chapter on Mary Surratt, and in a forthcoming volume for Oxford, she has a piece titled Women Making History, Mary, Mary Walker, Mary Surratt, and some lessons Civil War women have taught me. Dr. Leonard, have, as you might guess, has an impressive number of book reviews, articles, conference papers, and invited talks, and has written on a diverse range of topics. Uh, these in, go from Harriet Beecher Stowe to U.S. Grant. Professionally, she is a contributing member of the editorial board of Kent State University Press's series on the Civil War and on Fordham University Press's series uh, on the war in the North. She has served as a book referee for Northeastern University Press, LSU Press, National Geographic Press, Oxford University Press, and other publishers. She's a native of New York City, the mother of two young sons, Anthony, age 10, Joseph, age 8, sons whose native intelligence and love of learning, she tells me, uh, drive her forward as a scholar. Dr. Leonard will speak today on Lincoln and Joseph Holt. Holt, you will remember, I mentioned a second ago, led the prosecution of Booth's associates, including Samuel A. Mudd. Some years after, after Holt's death, Mrs. Mudd said of him that as a lady she would never, never speak ill of the dead, and therefore would only say that Holt was a harsh, unfeeling, and insincere a specimen of humanity. <laughs> Let's see if that was indeed the case. Please join me in welcoming to the lectern Dr. Elizabeth Leonard. Well, I'm so glad you turned the lights up. I was afraid I wouldn't be able to see my text without my glasses on. It's so lovely to be here. Thank you very much, particularly to Bob Willard and Steve Carson for inviting me. I had a lovely lunch with them last summer when I was down here, and uh, they invited me at that time, and I was just thrilled to be able to come. I also want to thank Bob for buying three copies of my book on that occasion, which was uh, very exciting for me. And I'm particularly delighted also to be in this very august company. Let me begin by saying that by inviting me to give this talk, Bob and Steve and others have indulged my great interest in Joseph Holt, someone I don't see quite as harshly as Mrs. Mudd, I'm afraid. I consider him 
to be an interesting person and someone who really is sorely understudied in Civil War era American history. I thank uh, Bob and Steve for their indulgence of my obsession with this person. And what I want to talk about today is really twofold, although it'll be interwoven together. First is, who is Joseph Holt? I sent one of my students to the library recently just to look at all the Lincoln biographies we had at our Colby Library and see if Holt shows up in the index anywhere. And she found almost no references to him, which is exactly what I expected. So who was he? Apart from, you know, the story that you maybe know of him in connection with the assassination trial. And why do I think he was so important? And then also, how does his life intersect with Lincoln's, because I think they do in some very interesting ways, even before we get to the point of the assassination trial. Joseph Holt was born in Breckenridge County, Kentucky, in January of 1807. Lincoln, of course, was born not far away in Hardin County, Kentucky, just about two years later, a little more than two years later. As a young child, Joseph Holt attended a neighborhood school, not unlike Lincoln, although Holt got a lot more schooling than Lincoln did, formal schooling. When he was 14, in uh, 1821, Holt's aspiring parents, who were rather sort of middle-level farmers who owned a few slaves, had great aspirations for their son, and they sent him to earn a proper private college education at Center College in Danville. This was paid for by a wealthier relative. Meanwhile, of course, at this time, uh, Lincoln's family had relocated to Indiana, where Lincoln was not being trained to be a lawyer or a prominent person, what, but was getting intermittent uh, bits and pieces of formal education and being raised to be, I guess, a farmer. In 1825, Holt was studying the law already after having finished college, studying it in Lexington, and he was studying with one of Kentucky's most famous attorneys, Robert Wycliffe. By 1828, Holt had opened his first law office in Elizabethtown in Hardin County, which was not very far from where Lincoln had been born. Around the same time, Lincoln was just beginning to take an interest in law himself. That summer, as one of his biographers writes, that summer that Holt is opening his first law practice, Lincoln was hanging around the log courthouses in Rockport and Boonville, Indiana. He was a sort of a legal buff. He watched transfixed as young country lawyers wooed juries, cross-examined witnesses, delivered impassioned summations. He listened to as old-timers sat on the steps of courthouses, spitting tobacco juice and discussing the latest trials and capricious workings of the law, the verdict a jury might reach, a sentence a judge might hand down. It was all very exciting to him, meaning Lincoln, a challenging new world that made his adrenaline flow. While Lincoln's adrenaline was flowing over the excitement of the law, Joseph Holt was busy keeping his practice running and developing it and becoming very firmly established. At the same time, he was also turning his attention to politics. Right from the beginning of his interest in politics in the late 1820s, Joseph Holt turned to the Democratic Party. He was a strong supporter of Andrew Jackson, and he did a lot of good service to the Democratic Party for, uh, through his law practice, but also through his many, many speeches on behalf of candidates over the next many years. He continued to expand his commitment to the Democratic Party over the years and to expand his fame as a great orator on political matters. But interestingly enough, he did not develop an interest in political office for himself. In 1832, after having enjoyed a lot of success in Elizabethtown with his practice, he moved his practice to Louisville, Kentucky, where he also began to edit a local newspaper. By this time, of course, Lincoln's family had relocated to uh, central Illinois, where he was continuing to dream of studying the law and dream perhaps more vividly than before. But Holt was moving on and becoming more of the established professional at this time. He was also uh, getting ready to be married. In 1835, Holt uh, was 28. He married and he became increasingly respectable and formidable as a prosecuting attorney for the Louisville Circuit. And he decided to move his practice as a result of his success down to Vicksburg, Mississippi, where, as it was put, uh, the abundant litigation that accompanied the development of cotton in this area soon made him a very rich man. Lincoln, during this period, was just striking out on his own, moving to the frontier community of New Salem, Illinois, 
where he would meet but not marry Anne Rutledge and embark, as it was later described by one biographer, upon a rigid curriculum of self-improvement, studying on his own and becoming increasingly absorbed with politics, not unlike Holt, except that unlike Holt, of course, Lincoln wasn't drawn to the Democratic Party. He was drawn to people like Henry Clay, not just because of Henry Clay's stance, uh, not least of all because of Henry Clay's stance on slavery, which reflected his work uh, in founding the American Colonization Society, which Lincoln also supported. Unlike Holt, uh, Lincoln would also develop uh, an interest in political office for himself, and as you know, in 1834, he ran for and won election as a Whig to the state legislature of Illinois, and then he also began to study the law in earnest so that his dreams of studying law became a reality. Even as Lincoln was beginning his first term in the state legislature of Illinois, down south in Vicksburg, Joseph Holt was maintaining a vigorous practice uh, of the law, spending so many hours of, of week on his work, in fact, that he was ruining his health. His wife's health, Mary's health, was also not very strong. And by 1842, the year, incidentally, that you've already heard Lincoln married Mary Todd, Holt and his wife Mary, who never did have any children, decided to return to Louisville from Vicksburg. They thought the climate was better there. Sadly, uh, although Holt himself re recovered from various illnesses that they had become subject to there, Mary died, and this plunged Joseph Holt into a period of abject despair. But in about four years, he regained his composure, married again, traveled to Europe and the Middle East, where he later said that he really... Although he had always loved American institutions and felt he should defend them, his belief in American political institutions was reconfirmed. After his trip to Europe with his second wife, Margaret, he returned to Louisville and continued to devote his time and energy to the Democratic Party. And by 1857, his star was very much on the rise in that party. He and Margaret moved to Washington, D.C., and soon after, he accepted his first appointment from James Buchanan, who was by then president. His first position in James Buchanan's administration was as commissioner of patents. According to the New York Times, this position, the commissioner of patents, was, quote, one that in, that in a high degree demanded perfect integrity of character added to a practical sense and a good knowledge of the law and of those public figures who were known to manifest these kinds of qualities, the Times reported, Mr. Holt stood preeminent. He was extremely well respected by people across the board in Washington. Over the next three years, he served as Commissioner of Patents in Buchanan's administration, and then beginning in the spring of 1859, he served as Postmaster General. As Postmaster General, Holt also maintained his firm resolve, his effective no-nonsense leadership, his unrelenting reliability in the face of all kinds of conflicts, and also another great personal tragedy when his second wife, Margaret, died as well following a long illness. Holt threw himself into his work even more vigorously than he had before, and his great work ethic and the, the sense of respect that people had for him continued to elevate him in Buchanan's eyes, not just as a responsible uh, administrator within the government, but as someone who could be trusted, someone who was level-headed in the face of crisis. So when Buchanan's avidly pro-Southern Secretary of War John Floyd of Virginia suddenly resigned on December 29, 1860, the president gladly heeded the advice of the man he had recently appointed Attorney General, Edwin Stanton, and appointed Holt to replace uh, Floyd as Secretary of War. According to contemporary, one contemporary source, Stanton not only advised Buchanan to nominate Holt, but he also urged Holt in a late night meeting at his home to accept Buchanan's offer. By December 1860, of course, going back to Lincoln, we know that Abraham Lincoln had skyrocketed to the presidency. In the years since his election to the state legislature, he had continued to build his law practice. He had continued to increase his presence in politics. He had become a star in the Republican Party, uh, and he had now achieved uh, the presidency. In fact, it is 
the fact that he is elected to the presidency that in many ways results in Holt becoming the Secretary of War because it is Lincoln's election to the presidency that show, throws James Buchanan's cabinet into crisis and leads to Floyd resigning and Holt replacing him. When Holt replaced Floyd as Secretary of War as a result of these events, the New York Times happily reported the change. On January 1st, 1861, the Times praised Holt's designation as Secretary of War as a, quote, step in the right direction. The New York Times was not unaware of Holt's affiliation with the Democratic Party, but despite his loyalty to that party and his deep roots, needless to say, in slaveholding Kentucky and the history of his own family being slaveholders, Holt was very much like fellow Kentuckian Clay and fellow Kentuckian Lincoln, widely known as a union man, honest, straightforward, and firm. Those are also the New York Times' remarks. He was known to share Henry Clay's devotion to the Union, if not his political party, and likewise Lincoln's devotion to the Union, if not his political party. Holt's appointment to, as Secretary of War was a source of great reassurance to Unionists across the nation. In contrast, fire eaters began to shake more in their boots than they had in the past. A letter from Lewis Wigfall of Texas to Millage Bonham in South Carolina a couple of days after Holt was appointed Secretary of War said very simply, this means war, cut off supplies from Robert Anderson and take Sumter as soon as possible. So clearly, people know who this man is and what he stands for and their uh, relative respect for and fear of him is, uh, is significant. Having accepted the post of Secretary of War, Joseph Holt busied himself immediately and tirelessly in the work of managing his department and trying to undermine secessionism while simultaneously enhancing Washington's defenses against the terrible conflict that he imagined was inevitable now. His task was complicated by the fact that there was persistent pro-Southern pro-secession sentiment within the administration itself, also in Congress, in the general population, even within his own family. As soon as he accepted the position of Secretary of War, Holt started receiving letters from many of his family members, not least of all his younger brother Robert, who contemned, condemned him roundly for taking this uh, job. I deeply regret, wrote Robert, that a sense of propriety or duty induces you to still remain among the advisors of the president. Buchanan is fast drifting into coercion, and coercion is war, war upon the South, war upon your country, your friends, your kindred, and it will probably find its way with fire and sword to the very hearthstones of our childhood. Robert was mistaken, of course, in his belief that Buchanan would ultimately adopt a policy of compelling the seceding states to return to the Union. Buchanan, of course, simply wanted to get out of Washington before anything happened. But Robert was right about Holt's sense of propriety and duty, both of which represented powerful driving forces in his character and undergirded his professional and personal conduct throughout his life, no matter how we may evaluate some of that uh, manifestation of his notion of duty and propriety today. Another essential driving force in Holt's personality was his persistent concern about the nature and responsibility of leadership and power. Quite simply, Holt believed that it was the burden of people in power to dedicate themselves and their blood and treasure, if necessary, to sustaining the common people in their devotion to the good against the uh, seduction of the evildoers, who he usually understood to be a small number of corrupting conspirators who would try to sour the mix. Uh, in the context of the crisis of the winter of 1860-61, of course, the good to which the common people of America should be held meant most, saliently, most saliently loyalty to the Union as an unbreakable trust. And so he set himself to work and summoned the General-in-Chief of the United States Army, Winfield Scott, to a private meeting very shortly after accepting his appointment as War Secretary. A primary focus for both Scott and Holt was the situation in Charleston Harbor. And as early as January uh, 5, 1861, 
having previously ordered Robert Anderson, who was also a native of Kentucky, to assume a strictly defensive posture against potential attackers in Charleston, Holt authorized, it was Holt who authorized the USS Star of the West to travel down to Charleston from New York, carrying both supplies and soldiers to uh, Anderson's forces. The vessel reached South Carolina on the night of January 8th, the next morning, as the ship approached Fort Sumter, shots rang out, first from Morris Island, then from Fort Moultrie, and because of the delayed arrival of orders issued on January 9th, permitting him to respond if he was fired upon, Major Anderson held his fire, and the Star of the, rest, Star of the West headed back out to sea. The moment in truth in Charleston had been postponed, but Holt's struggle for the Union against what he believed to be these bands of traitors and conspirators who threatened to destroy it had only just begun in earnest. As such, reinforcing Major Anderson was just one of his new goals. At the same time, he devoted considerable time and energy to reorganizing and streamlining his department, purging it of insurrectionists, uh, their allies and their influence, and shaping the Department of War into an unequivocal agent of the Union's survival. One friend of his from Springfield, Ohio, wrote on January 24th, whatever may be the result of this mad disunion scheme, the future historian will record your name as the only clear-headed, noble, and honest member of the former cabinet of Mr. Buchanan. Wiggins, uh, this was D, uh, H. Wiggins. Wiggins' remarks reflect the unparalleled confidence of countless Northerners and border state folks and, the, and determined anti-secessionists in Holt's unflappable unionism. As Holt cast a stern eye around at the defenses of the federal capital in the early months of 1861, he found them sorely lacking. And on February 18th, he issued a report to President Buchanan expressing his concerns about Washington's ability to defend itself from attack by the seceded states. Holt clearly believed that a strong display of military might at this time would offer the revolutionaries, as he sometimes called them, the fire eaters, the secessionists, the rebels, the best evidence of the administration's, quote, determination as well as ability to maintain its laws. At the same time that this show of military force would serve as the most effective means, he said, of baffling and dissolving any conspiracy that might have been organized. Holt was deeply concerned as well about, about bringing the newly elected president, Abraham Lincoln, safely into office. As you know, Abraham Lincoln arrived in the federal capital a few days later, a few days after Holt had filed his report. Uh, as uh, his March 4th inaugural, with all of its potentially grave implications, drew nearer, Holt focused more and more of his energy on both the War Department work and on protecting the future president's life. And just a couple of days after the safe inauguration of Abraham Lincoln, the New York Times again reported to Joseph Holt's fidelity and to his sagacity and courage when clothed with the powers of the War Department, the present administration owes the fact that it was peacefully inaugurated or perhaps inaugurated at all. And so the lives of these two backwoods Kentuckians, now both in their early 50s, who had taken separate paths to accomplishment in the law and in politics, one of them a Democrat, the other a Republican, but equally committed to the Union above all, the lives of these two men came to be linked together in a profound and enduring way. It is true Simon Cameron soon replaced Holt as Secretary of War. Lincoln did not continue him in that position. But rumors and hopes began to be heard very quickly after Lincoln's inauguration to the effect that Lincoln would find Holt a different cabinet post or perhaps make him a Supreme Court justice or do something to demonstrate his appreciation for Holt's unionism and his service. Holt's own papers contain a note from Abraham Lincoln dated March 12, 1861, announce, uh, summoning him to a private meeting in uh, the executive mansion, and such an appointment may have been discussed. It's also possible, however, that that meeting was not about an appointment for Joseph Holt to a cabinet post or to a, 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 bench, a, to a seat on the bench of the Supreme Court, but rather for, it was perhaps organized to 
permit a conversation between Lincoln and Holt about the possibility of Holt taking on the task of holding Kentucky in the Union. Kentucky, of course, was the home state they shared, and they shared it with uh, Jefferson Davis as well, as you know. And, and as you also know, Lincoln was deeply concerned that Kentucky remain within the loyal states. And it's clear that, it, that in the immediate months after uh, Lincoln came into the executive mansion, Holt did not receive an appointment to the cabinet or to the Supreme Court. Rather, he went forth as an independent citizen on the nation's behalf, bless you, uh, to launch a personal campaign to ensure Kentucky's loyalty. It's indis uh, a, and he went indisputably with Lincoln's blessing and encouragement. Central to the argument that Holt brought to the divided people of Kentucky through the press and in many speeches that he made while visiting the state in the spring and summer of 1861 was his notion that the rebellion was the work of a small but virulent conspiracy dedicated to the pursuit of an evil goal, a conspiracy which only the wisdom and selflessness of the common people and loyal, faithful Unionist leaders like himself and Lincoln could possibly overcome. In his mind, although the Kentucky legislature had initially endorsed a position of neutrality, there remained within its borders a, a band of agitators, as he put it, whose primary and immediate aim was to push Kentucky into the arms of the Confederacy for the sake of their own selfish political ambitions. Neutrality, he said, is not an op option. Rather, activism on behalf of the Union's survival is the key, and he summoned his fellow Kentuckians to rise up, as he and Lincoln and Anderson had done, to, quote, twine each thread of the glorious tissue of our country's flag about our heartstrings and defend the stars and stripes. In the end, the crisis in Kentucky came abruptly to a head. In early September 1861, Confederate General Leonidas Polk's troops invaded the states. The state. Two days later, Ulysses Grant's forces accepted the Kentucky legislature's invitation to drive out the intruders, and for the duration of the war, Kentucky remained officially outside the bounds of the Confederacy and officially within the Union camp, although we know the Kentuckians fought on both sides, uh, and there was much bloodshed in the streets as well. In Washington, Lincoln expressed an enormous sense of relief upon learning of the, the news of Kentucky's decision, as did Holt's Unionist allies back home in the state. In September, longtime friend Theodore Bell sent words of profound appreciation to Holt from Louisville. Kentucky, he, re he wrote, has responded fully to your demands. Neutrality died here last Tuesday night so suddenly that a coroner would be justified in issuing a writ of inquiry to ascertain whether it was a case of suicide. Kentucky remained in the Union, and by the late fall of 1861, it's clear that a grateful Lincoln was contemplating finding an official place for Holt in his administration. In December, Holt received a letter from their common friend, Joshua Speed, informing him that Lincoln was searching for a way to repay Holt in some form commensurate with the service he had rendered the country. Sensing, as many did, that Simon Cameron's days as Secretary of War were numbered, Speed urged Holt to hang on for that War Department position. But on January 14, 1862, Holt's old friend, Edwin Stanton, was named to replace Simon uh, Cameron, and Holt was not bitter about this in any way that I can tell. They exchanged warm letters to one another, Stanton writing to acknowledge Holt's generosity and not being bitter about this, and perhaps even having suggested his name. Stanton wrote, the cordial approval you have given me to my appointment, you have given to my appointment is known and fully appreciated. Your regard and support strengthen my heart more than I can tell. My feeling towards yourself you already know. We stood together in the beginning of this mighty contest, and by God's blessing, we will stand together until the end. Stanton was right to be grateful, as I said. Evidence suggests that Holt had perhaps not only suggested his name, but had worked uh, to support Lincoln's famously rather cantankerous new war secretary uh, by means of lending his own authority to the nomination. In any case, Stanton and Holt would soon get to work together closely again. On September 3, 1862, Lincoln found that spot for Holt. Holt became his choice to fill a new position in the federal bureaucracy, that of Judge Advocate General in Stanton's War Department. 
Holt held this position for over a decade until his retirement from government service in December of 1875. First, he had the rank of colonel, later beginning in June of 1864 when the Bureau of Military Justice was organized under his leadership, he received the rank of brigadier general. A month after his appointment, Holt publicly reiterated his resolute loyalty to the Union in words that were most prescient. He said, I am for the Union as unconditionally as I am for protecting my own body at every cost and hazard from the knife of the assassin. It wasn't his body, apparently, that was needing the greatest protection. The post of Judge Advocate Holt meant that Holt worked under his friend Stanton, overseeing the War Department's policy regarding legal affairs within the military and its policy with regard to civilian political prisoners, the latter policy soon to be extended by Lincoln's September 24, 1862 proclamation suspending the writ of habeas corpus and for the first time requiring military trials for, quote, all rebels and insurgents, their aiders and abettors within the United States and all persons discouraging volunteer enlistments, resisting militia drafts, or guilty of any disloyal practice, affording comfort to the rebels against the authority of the United States. Somebody pointed out to me today this is not unlike the Patriot Act uh, of 1862. In Lincoln's eyes, at least, Holt was the ideal man for this demanding job, an unswerving and apparently tireless unionist, a brilliant legal mind, a great orator, a man known for his honesty and integrity. More than a year before his appointment, Holt had told Kentucky Union troops stationed in Indiana, I don't hesitate to say that any and every measure required to save the republic from the perils that beset it not only may, but ought to be taken by the administration promptly and fearlessly. As you know, Lincoln was hardly an inflexible defender of civil rights during this war, and he undoubtedly found Holt's attitude very reassuring. In his capacity as Judge Advocate General, Joseph Holt was charged with guaranteeing the administration of military laws in courts martial, courts of inquiry, and military commissions, and he was described as uniform and just, uh, in, all, in most of his cases. Um, and he was, it was he who was required to now interpret this law to understand what sorts of uh, offenses Lincoln's proclamation encompassed, which offenses would, be, uh, would result in military trial, which, results would, which offenses would not, and so on. In the course of his service as wartime judge advocate general, a large proportion of his time was occupied by trials internal to the military, but he also was very closely connected to the trials of Clement Vallandigham and Lambden B. Milligan, two landmark cases uh, during the war dealing with the issue of civil rights and, of course, opposition to the war. Another assignment that Holt had during his time as Advocate General had to do with his uh, examination of the secret societies of Copperheads and others whose influence and whose membership seemed to be growing in the North and in the West. In the summer of 1864, in addition to overseeing thousands of uh, legal cases connected with the military, literally tens of thousands of legal cases, he was assigned to undertake an extensive examination of organizations like the so-called Order of the American Knights and the Knights of the Golden Circle, whose influence was growing and about whom or to whom he applied this notion of these small conspiracies that were corrupting the minds of otherwise good people in places like Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and perhaps most troubling to him, in Kentucky. In his investigation, Holt studied the aims of these organizations and concluded that they shared as their primary goals the embarrassment of the government in its military operations, the inciting of armed rebellion, the undermining of efforts being made in these states to enlist black soldiers, and so on. In October 1864, Holt delivered a lengthy report of his findings focused on the Knights of the Golden Circle to Secretary Stanton. For Holt, the Knights of the Golden Circle was a frighteningly large and effective fraternity, and like spreading copperheadism generally, and before that, Southern nationalism, it amounted to yet another manifestation of the power of a few crazed conspirators to 
a few crazed conspirators at the top to corrupt the minds of otherwise mild-mannered people to arouse, to arouse them to what he called a parasitical spirit and to drive them into desperate violent action against the benevolent institutions and leadership of the republic and its loyal citizens. As he had believed in various contexts all along, the nation's very life depended on identifying and crushing the fomenters of this kind of madness, male and female, and only then could peace be restored and the nation's survival be assured. By the time we get to April 14th of 1865, not unlike his hardworking commander-in-chief in the executive mansion, uh, the 58-year-old Joseph Holt was very tired. But he was very pleased at that point with the thought that by this time he had actually completed the bulk of his hard wartime work as Judge Advocate General, as head of the United States government's Bureau of Military Justice, and the war seemed to be truly coming to an end. Just a few days before, the like millions across the Union, Holt had exulted in the surrender of Robert E. Lee to Ulysses Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. He had exulted in the general collapse of Confederate arms that surrender signified. Since then, Holt had traveled south from Washington into the, as I call it in the book, the almost fully defanged viper's nest to participate in ceremonies that had great meaning for him. Holt was invited on April 14, 1865 to give a talk in honor of the resumption of federal authority at Fort Sumter. The formal raising of the stars and the stripes at the fort uh, took place on April 14th, and he gave a talk at a dinner that followed that ceremony. In his speech at the Charleston House, Judge Advocate General Holt sounded familiar themes. He advocated mercy for the Southern people generally. After all, they had merely been misled, but he did not sound any themes of mercy for the Confederate leadership. Instead, he credited them with four bloody years of war and many, many heinous crimes, the most heinous of which, in his mind, was yet to occur, uh, and he had no idea. The Republic, he declared in, at this moment in Charleston, had been saved through the invincible uh, strength of its uh, supporters, and the conspirators had been uh, stopped in their tracks. But even as he was thrilling his audiences in Charleston, as you know, back in Washington, a scene of terrible events was unfolding. A small band of villains, very much like the villains that Holt had been watching for all along and condemning all along, was setting about the work of assassinating the president, uh, killing his secretary of state, and also going after other members of the government leadership. And Holt was uh, quickly alerted to these developments. The word spread very quickly, and it made it up to Holt in Charleston. And he, in a state of great perplexity, enragement, uh, and deep sadness, returned to Washington. It came to no surprise to him to find that Secretary Stanton was already well underway, uh, taking care of the investigation into these attacks and to the um, attempted murder, which would soon become the completed murder of the president. Uh, and he conferred very carefully with Stanton, who within a few days, as the war continued to wind down, needed to turn his attention elsewhere. So as Stanton needed to turn his attention elsewhere, he convinced Holt to take over the investigation of the, cons the conspiracy that seemed to have been afoot and to then proceed to be the head of the, the uh, commission that would try the conspirators as they were brought uh, in from the uh, streets of Washington and Maryland and elsewhere. Joseph Holt, I would say, was the perfect figure to become Lincoln's principal avenger. And that's where the title of the book comes from, relating to Holt as his avenger and the people that stood with Holt to try to avenge this death. And in the months and years that followed, Joseph Holt would take that responsibility on very seriously. He pursued Booth's co-conspirators with relentless 
fervor, serving as the government's chief prosecutor in the May-June trial of the conspirators that led to the execution of four of those conspirators and the incarceration of four others. He also worked actively behind the scenes to bring Mary Surratt's son to justice, uh, John Surratt, and then he also made this great play uh, to try to cap, to try to prove that Jefferson Davis was at the head of the whole scheme, that he was the moving force behind Lincoln's murder. Ultimately and tragically, I think, it's in this effort that Joseph Holt, who had been a beacon of hope and security to so many Northerners and Unionists everywhere, sacrificed much of the respect he had earned over the years, the respect for his clear judgment, for his even-handedness, for his adherence to law and principle. Having personally assumed the responsibility in the early part of 1861 to guarantee the life of Abraham Lincoln and save the Union, he felt he had done a lot for one but failed in the other, and he was determined to punish Lincoln's killers and any other Confederate leaders who he felt had put them up to the dirty deed in the first place. I would argue that the toll that his obsession took on him and his reputation was really nothing more, nothing less than a kind of political death and a purging from the ranks of the great figures we memorialize from this era. Rather than standing tall with Lincoln in memory as a result of his increasingly, I would admit it, undisciplined quest to avenge Lincoln's death and by extension the war itself, Joseph Holt consigned himself to disappearance except when he is revived as an example of the radical Republicans, and of course he was never a Republican, but he is a symbol of the extremism that they took to crush the errant South after the war. That he made mistakes and some grave ones, which are uh, outlined in detail in the book, this is not in doubt. But that he was loyal to Lincoln and to the Union, and an unwavering defender and friend of both should not be forgotten. Thank you. Happy to take questions. Way in the back. Success tried to prevent uh, or tried to uh, cause a, uh, pro-union Kentuckians to oppose slavery. Did Holt support those efforts? And if he opposed slavery, when did he oppose slavery? When did he start opposing slavery? He started to, well, he started to oppose slavery before the war began. But I think, I think it, my sense of him in the time that Lincoln is trying to woo these um, slaveholding Kentuckians and convince them to give up their slaves, I, I think that he's tried to steer clear of that. I don't have evidence of him getting involved in that. His focus was always in that early period just on maintaining loyalty to the Union and doing it in an active way because if you didn't maintain loyalty, then you were essentially helping the enemy. But he himself did reach an anti-slavery stance before the war had even begun and he was a pretty avid supporter of the enlistment of African American troops as well. Exactly. Hi. Or at least Joseph Holt. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I think um, so. Though. Although it's cited within the context of Article, uh, I believe Article One, and the Constitution is technically silent on whether the President or Congress has the authority to suspend the writ of habeas corpus. Did Holt ever issue any formal advisory opinion on, on whether he believed Congress or the President has the authority? I'm not aware that he did. I do know he wrote extensively about. Um, what he understood his jurisdiction to be after that fact, you know, and, and he wrote copiously on that, and there's actually a couple, well, there's at least one unpublished study of him in terms of his, you know, studying his interpretation of the, the um, Suspension Act and how he then applied the um, authority that he thought that he had, but I'm not aware that he wrote extensively on that question. He simply agreed with it. Yes. Uh, yes, Professor uh, Leonard. One small correction. The Judge Advocate General Post existed, but it was moribund. As Harold Hyman says, it was, um, it was um, Holt's genius to revive it and turn it into the modern institution that it is today now. On the matter of conspiracy theory or thinking, 
Have you, uh, you, I'm sure you've read Mark Neely's new book on Civil War political culture. Conspiracy theory was something both sides or all parties indulged in. For instance, Jacob Howard is considered a hero of radical Republican of abolitionism, and yet he used to give hair-raising conspiracy theory lectures on how Jesuit priests had corrupted, corrupted not just America but the entire world, and we had to be on our guard lest they become allied with the slave power. Well, Don't you think... And that the question is, isn't Holt really representative of his time in holding to conspiracy theory? And actually, Lincoln is, is actually an exception. When it comes to conspiracy theories, both sides are rife with them. Well, I think that's probably true. I don't think he was an outlier in any sense, although he certainly was uh, very extreme in his views, and he seemed to see everything through that, increasingly everything was through that lens. Right. Yes. I've been working on Lincoln's uh, pardons, his use of the pardon power. And if you come at that question, you find the name of Joseph Holt uh, figuring large. Now, when you talk about him, you, sh you show that his life has such a, so many other elements that that fades, uh, fades clear out of significance. But I picture Holt coming over from his office with these stacks of uh, of courts martial and sitting there with Nicolay and Lincoln going through sometimes for hours uh, pardon uh, appeals for clemency. Uh, do you have something to say about Holt's role in that? Was did he reinforce Lincoln's mercy, or was he uh, a harder line on uh, Union soldiers who deserted and the like? I think, of, I think of him as taking a harder line, frankly. I think of him as being pretty much the, the sort of um, way out on the hard line end of things and, and being tougher, I think, than Lincoln even. Although I think Lincoln liked that about him, that it gave Lincoln a little cushion, a little more room to maneuver because Holt was there relentlessly holding the line. Right, right, that it gave him a little more maneuvering room. And, and Holt and Stanton, I think of as being so, so closely allied with each other, which is, makes it curious again to me why Holt's story has disappeared. And, and so few people know of him except in relation to the trial because he's so important through that whole period and so close to Stanton. Well, don't get me started on Johnson. <laughs> Somebody once said of my book that I was um, that I was distressed to discover that they said in my book Andrew Johnson stands tall, and I thought clearly this person didn't read the book because I'm not fond of him. Last question. Well, uh, I am one of those who believes in the con possible conspiracy of Stanton. Obviously, Holt, his friend, wouldn't agree. But would you comment on the possibility that Stanton and his minions did not conspire with Booth and all, but knew about it and made arrangements that Booth could succeed? I happen to find that unpersuasive. And I've told a couple of people... I, that's that's the way I read the evidence. I, I told a couple of people that I think that our uh, Matthew Pinsker's talk about the soldiers' home and Stanton and mentioning Stanton in that context, it, it, to me it's one of the reasons why I find it incomprehensible that Stanton would have even, regardless of his views on Reconstruction, which is often used as the excuse, he thought Lincoln was going to be soft on Reconstruction, etc., he loved Lincoln, and I cannot imagine. And his response to the assassination of Lincoln was a tremendous distress and horror and grief. And I just, I, I can't imagine he would have countenanced it. Uh, certainly not have instigated it. And I just don't buy the theory that he, that he was behind it in any way or countenanced it. Thank you.